So it is 7.34 p.m. on Thursday, March 23rd, 2023. Good evening, everyone. My name is Christian Klein. I am the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals, and I'm calling this meeting of the board to order. I ask all attendees who are not recognized by the chair to please mute their connections until such time as they're recognized by the chair. I would like to confirm all members and anticipated officials are present uh, from the Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, Roger DuPont. Here. Patrick Hanlon. Here. Uh, Dan Riccadelli. Here. Uh, Venkat Holly. Here. Elaine Hoffman. Here. And our newest member, Adam LeBlanc. Here. Great to have you all. Um, here on behalf of the town, Colleen Rawlson, the zoning assistant. Here. Good to have you. And I don't think we have any other uh, town employees with us. Um, consultants for the board, we have Paul Haverty. Paul, good to have you with us. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good evening. And we also have uh, Sean Reardon with us. Sean, good to have good you. Evening. Good evening. And I have not seen uh, Cliff this evening, uh, but I think he may not have been available tonight. I can't recall. Um, and then appearing on behalf of the applicant, we have Paul Feldman. Good evening. Good evening. Um, and joining him from the Majuri companies, we have Jackie Majuri and Paul Majuri. Uh, Matt, who's normally with us, is unavailable this evening. And uh, also joining them is Chris Mulhern. Are, are there any others, Paul? Uh, not, not this evening. Okay, great. Well, this open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely, consistent with an act relative to extending certain state of emergency accommodations signed into law on July 16th, 2022. This act includes an extension until March 31st, 2023 of the remote meeting provisions of Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 to executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, which suspended the requirement to hold all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Public bodies may continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the public body physically present at a meeting location, so long as they provide adequate alternative access to remote meetings. Public bodies may meet remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. An opportunity for public comment will be provided during the public comment period during each public hearing. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via the Zoom application with online and telephone access as listed on the agenda posted to the town's website, identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it will be broadcast by ACMI. Please be aware that attendees are participating by a variety of means. Some attendees are participating by video conference, others are participating by computer audio or by telephone. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you, your screen name, or another identifier. Please take care to not share personal information. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. We ask you to please maintain decorum during the meeting, including displaying an appropriate background. All supporting materials that have been provided to members of this body are available on this meeting's agenda or on the town's website unless otherwise noted. And the public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. As chair, I reserve the right to take items out of order in the interest of promoting an orderly meeting. Um, so this evening on our agenda, we do only have the two items. Uh, one is the public participation details, which we have just covered. And uh, item number two is docket 3719, which is 1021, 1025 Massachusetts Avenue. So returning to the comprehensive permit hearing for the residences at Mill Brook. This evening, the board is continuing the comprehensive permit hearing for the residences at Mill Brook, the redevelopment of an existing site in the neighborhood office B1 district. The submitted documents are available from the board's website or as an attachment to the posted agenda. At the January hearings, the board heard testimony regarding wetlands and stormwater plans for the property, traffic and transportation issues, and architectural considerations. At the February hearings, the board heard testimony regarding landscape plans, revisions to the civil plans, revisions to the architectural plans, and presentation of the construction management plan. Tonight, we plan to discuss progress of the Applicants Wetland Protection Act application before the Conservation Commission, revisions to the plans for the construction phase of the project, and any of the revisions presented by the applicant. We will also discuss the historic status of the building at 1021 Massachusetts Avenue, and we'll review the revised waiver request from the applicant. After members of the board have had an opportunity to ask their questions of the applicant, the hearing will be open for public comment and questions on the topics discussed this evening. The board is reaching the end of the scheduled hearings for this project. 
Under state law, as extended by the consent of the applicant, the public hearing phase of this project must conclude before April 30th, 2023. The board will hear public comment at this session on topics related to the materials pres presented this evening. Comments from the public, which do not specifically relate to topics under discussion this evening, are important to the board. We request that those comments be submitted by email to the board for their consideration. And at the conclusion of public comment, the board will discuss the plans for the next session with the applicant before a vote to continue this hearing and adjourning for the evening. So at this point, I'd like to reintroduce attorney Paul Feldman from Davis Mullen D'Augustine to introduce tonight's present presenters. Paul? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening, members of the zoning board. Uh, we're, I'm here on behalf of the applicant uh, for this uh, 40B uh, development. Um, 1021 Mass Ave LLC. Uh, uh, with me is Paul Maggiore from the Maggiore Companies and Jacqueline Maggiore um, and um, Chris Mulhern, who is the architect uh, for the proposed development. Uh, my name is Paul Feldman, as the chair mentioned. I'm an attorney that represents the applicant. Um, as the chair mentioned, we're um, uh, coming to the end of, uh, of uh, a series of public hearings that have been, I think, very uh, productive and, and comprehensive. And tonight we have um, uh, a few things on our agenda to, um, to, to close out the presentation uh, by the applicant. Uh, the three things we'd like to do tonight um, is um, the chair requested at our last hearing that we present uh, the sustainability materials that uh, we filed with the board um, a few, few weeks back. So Chris Mul Mulhern, the project's architect, will do that. Uh, the second thing is that there are uh, some uh, slight changes to uh, the four plans that we would like to present um, uh, they're in response to uh, comments made by the third party review act architect, um, specifically addressing a second means of egress from the second floor patio area and a couple other things that Chris Mulhern will present. Um, the final thing we'd like to do tonight is um, at our last hearing, the chair uh, mentioned that he was gonna make an effort to start to pull together a list of subjects that would be um, uh, potential conditions to the permit. Uh, the chair emailed me the, 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 the list that he had prepared. Um, we've been through the list. We've picked up a few other items that from our notes, um, we understood the board was interested in considering for conditions. And um, I also understand that uh, uh, Mr. Haverty uh, is is um, uh, working on a, a proposed decision to be presented potentially next meeting, and so I thought it would make it made some sense that I put together a, a quick, comprehensive um, rework of of the uh, list that I've gotten of proposed conditions, and we could quickly walk through them each of them tonight, so Mr. Haverty could hear. Um, both from the applicant and the zoning board, what it is that we're trying to accomplish with the uh, condition and give him guidance uh, on these on these specific conditions. Uh, I'm not suggesting that these conditions are a conclusive list. I know that the board has issued comprehensive permits in the town previously, and there's probably, I'll call them standard conditions or some conditions that um, even though they may not be mentioned on this list, uh, may appear in a draft decision, but but the idea was to sort of focus on the uh, project-specific um, items that uh, uh, everyone, uh, we've been keeping note of, and I think the, the board has been keeping note of. So that's what we have for tonight, and with that, I'll uh, turn it over to Chris Mulhern, um, and Chris, I'll leave it up to you if you want to present sustainability or if you want to present the, the small changes that were made since uh, since we were here last. Uh, thanks, Paul. Mr. Chairman, Chris Mulhern for Harrison Mulhern Architects. If I can share my screen. Uh, you should be able to do so. Uh, I think we'll start with the sustainability uh, document. Uh, this is a document that we filed 
with the board, uh, I think, two and a half weeks ago. And I'm not going to go through each and every line item of it, but I want to just give you the overview and the flavor of what we're attempting to do with this project. Uh, and there, there are a number of categories here to, to talk about. First of all, with respect to location and transportation, uh, this project is on a major uh, arterial route. Um, it, it's uh, connected by bus service to uh, commuter rail and to the red line at Harvard Station. There are uh, resources within walking distance for uh, for food and uh, drug stores and um, the uh, playgrounds and the other community amenities that uh, make a project viable. Um, the five-story height that we're proposing uh, allows a higher density on a smaller footprint. Uh, we have parking spaces, one per unit. We have EV charging stations in the garage uh, for 11 cars with the potential to go to 100% EVs uh, going forward. As far as the site goes, uh, we're, we're going to be doing uh, pollution prevention during construction with the uh, barriers to prevent runoff from the site. We're going to be making significant changes in the property to the point where the stormwater uh, generated by the impervious cover is all treated on the site instead of flowing off the site as it does now. As we've talked about in previous meetings, the, uh, the rear of the site will be developed as uh, a native species urban garden, if you will, uh, with uh, lots of new trees, new tree seedlings, uh, and um, sustainable habitat for, for birds and small animals. We also have uh, a raised plaza on the second floor, which provides an outdoor green space and reduces the heat island effect, as does the white reflective roof uh, on, the, on the building. As far as water goes, uh, we have drought tolerant native uh, plants in the proposed landscape plan. We'll be using limited water in both the ground level plant material and the plaza level plant material. And we'll be metering the or monitoring the uh, water consumption unit by unit so that uh, residents can be mindful of, of what they're doing in terms of uh, water use. The building design will be uh, an all electric uh, building for domestic uh, heating and cooling, domestic hot water. We do have to bring a gas service into the building because the uh, standby power requirements for the elevator uh, require that the that the elevator be operational for two hours after the uh, after a power uh, shutoff, and we haven't figured out a way to do that with batteries at this point. So we will have a, a gas fired a generator on the roof, and I'll come back to that when we get to the plan changes. The building itself will be designed to meet the stretch energy code, uh, the newly enacted stretch energy code, which is uh, now in the Department of Energy Resources uh, under a, a rule called 225 CMR Chapter 23. Um, we'll be uh, using one of the three methods uh, uh, for compliance on that. It will be, uh, the, the building envelope will be evaluated uh, during the design to uh, ensure that the overall U value of the building, comprehensive U value uh, meets the requirements of the code. Uh, there will be continuous insulation on the exterior of the building. There will be a continuous uh, air vapor barrier at the perimeter of the building. Steps will be taken to minimize the amount of, of bridging and the amount of um, energy transfer uh, to through elements of the exterior of the building. Uh, it'll be a heat pump based system with individual control unit by unit. Uh, the unit's appliances will be energy star rated and the performance of the building will be evaluated by a HERS rater uh, before the units come online. Uh, in the event, uh, the you should know that the the uh, the specialized update of the uh, energy code, the stretch energy code, to the uh, expanded performance code is on the warrant in Arlington for the Springtown meeting. It's Article 10, 
right? In the event that that article passes, which I have every expectation it will, uh, to the extent that it's applicable to this project, we will be complying with those uh, more stringent uh, rules with respect to uh, energy conservation. Uh, we're going to do our best to uh, maximize recycling of the construction waste and to uh, source materials locally. And we're going to do our best to maintain high quality of interior uh, environment by way of uh, minimizing VOCs in the new product, products in the project, uh, using energy recovery ventilation in the units and using LED lighting. So that in a nutshell is a summary of where we are with the uh, sustainability. We are expecting this to be a very efficient project with um, excellent systems uh, to uh, minimize energy use. We have we will be solar ready. We have a lot of footprint on the roof available for solar panels. And as things develop, we may be generating some power on site as well. Uh, I want to change over now to this other screen to talk for just a brief minute about some changes to the plan. Uh, if I can make this go, yeah. So uh, this is the project, obviously. The, the, there are uh, uh, changes to some of the drawings in response to the comments that have been made by members of the board and uh, advisors to the board. On the second floor, uh, after a dialogue with the uh, building commissioner, we've added an additional egress path from the second floor exterior plaza. Um, the commissioner, uh, as is his want, uh, as the uh, authority having jurisdiction, made a ruling that the space is uh, should be considered as assembly use, uh, the portion of it that's public. So we've added a second egress and we've increased the egress capacity to 360 persons from, from that space. Here's the revised plan. You can see the blue arrow is pointing here to this additional egress path out of the space. On the fifth floor, as I mentioned, we've had we had to put the generator back in. We thought we could get away without having it, but it didn't work uh, because we couldn't find a battery solution for uh, the elevator operation. So on the fifth floor plan, we've put the generator back in the position that it was uh, previous iterations of the drawings. On the elevation package, we've made these four changes. We've added the standby generator back in. We've uh, coordinated the uh, grades with the civil plans. One of the board members mentioned that we hadn't, or maybe it was Cliff, mentioned that we hadn't quite gotten the exterior elevations coordinated. As a result of that process, we uh, had to make some adjustments to the garage windows and the green screens to make everything work. So here is the front elevation uh, with the generator enclosure added back in on the left-hand side here. This is the left side elevation with the generator enclosure at the top, the uh, fence and gate at the back of the building, and then revised grade line uh, for uh, the ground plane here. Uh, the the ground, the, the existing elevations at the property line on the left side of the property cause us to bring the grade up from the front of the building to uh, this high point and then slope back down. As a result of that change, we were required to reduce the size of these windows in the garage and then this group here to make them match up. So these two locations have garage louvers above uh, windows with the reduced height. The green screens here in the middle were also reduced in height. Here is the rear elevation with the grade line adjusted. Uh, and you can see that the grade is a little higher between the two doors than in previous versions of this drawing. And it's a little lower at this right-hand corner where uh, the walkway 
goes out to the sidewalk. And then finally, uh, this is the right side elevation with the grades adjusted to follow what's on the civil drawings. There's a curb at this rear service door to the retail space. The grade slopes down gently to about here, and then it drops off a little more steeply to the back corner of the building. Uh, here again, we were uh, obliged to make an adjustment in the green screen treatment to make it match up with the grading. Uh, and that is what I have. I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. Are there questions from the board in relation to those changes? Do not see any. Mr. Chair. Mr. Riccardelli. Yeah, just a, I have just two questions um, I jotted down during that presentation. Uh, so uh, for the generator, it looked like on the uh, elevation, I think you mentioned it, but that was still have a, a screen around. That's it, correct. Right? It, it's, it's, a, it's a drawing with a 10 foot high screen. We, we don't know exactly what generators can be acquired, but typically they have uh, an acoustic enclosure and they have a raised base, okay. a skid base. And so we're hoping it can be a little shorter than this, but we're not quite sure yet. But you would you would uh, be proposing an acoustic enclosure for that? Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, the last question, if, if I could, Mr. Chair. Please. Uh, uh, you mentioned uh, that the building is all electric uh, with the exception of the generator, but I, I seem to remember that there was gas to the retail. Is that still the case or has that been removed? Uh, we'll, we'll have a feed to that retail space just to keep the flexibility. Uh, certain types of retail uh, have exemptions to even in all electric buildings. Um, sure. But at this point, we really have no idea what that tenancy is going to look like. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Are there other questions from the board? Mr. Chair, I had one question. Mr. Please. Um, th this is a podium building, correct? Um, yes, sir. W there was no mention of the uh, separation insulation requirement there between the podium and the residential. I know one of the pathways has a stricter rule on that um, based on the latest stretch code. Yeah. Uh we're planning at this point to condition the garage to uh, a, a low continuous temperature. So there will be a heating system in the garage and there will be a thermal barrier between the garage and the uh, residential spaces above. Exactly what that looks like, I just don't know yet, you know, but uh, there is a requirement that there be uh, thermal insulation between those the, the two uses, the garage use and the residential use above. Okay, okay. Because there are some, uh, on one of the elevations you had these um, decorative screens that, you know, it's not a insulated glazing, right? Not all of the garages. It's, so um, I so guess... these, these screen elements here are, are applied to the surface. Okay. Right. They're yeah. not. They don't go through the wall, excepting the anchorage. Uh, okay. The balance of the the open ones that are drawn here, white. These are actual windows. They're probably going to be fixed glass. You know, so picture window type deal. Uh, so. Okay. So it is in for all. You know, like a tempered condition, tempered space. No. Yes, it's okay. a tempered space. That's correct. Oh, thank you. That's all I had, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Other questions from the board? Uh, Mr. Chair? Yes, please, Ms. Hoffman. Um, I, I really appreciated uh, getting to look through the sustainability memo. Uh, and I noticed that under the energy and atmosphere section, uh, there were a number of targets listed under envelope. Uh, and I was just wondering if the team had established uh, an energy use target. I I didn't see it in the memo. I wasn't sure if it existed yet. Uh, and I was also wondering 
if there was a just following up on the envelope pieces, I think all the opaque elements were identified, but I was wondering if there was a target performance value for the windows. Uh, great question, Elaine. The answer is no, we haven't established an energy target for the overall building. Uh, we're looking at a series of trade-offs. Um, and the biggest one, honestly, is uh, between double and triple play paying windows. Uh, we're looking at, uh, you know, double pane windows that are uh, getting us a, a U value of uh, 0.28 or 0.29, uh, and we think we can we can make that happen. The triple pane windows are much better. Uh, at, they're coming in at around 0.19 or 0 0.20, which is which is great. Uh, the, the question is, and, and the design piece that will happen over, you know, the next phases of this project are trading off the window piece against the exterior envelope and the, the wall, the, the wall U values. Uh, and, and that comprehensive study has not been done yet. It's it's helpful to hear. I'll just uh, I think I had brought this up in an early um, in an earlier meeting, um, but if it's always helpful to also look at the embodied carbon of the windows alongside their performance value, um, yes. and so I uh, I just wanted to raise that um, since it didn't appear under the materials and resources section. I think even if a life cycle assessment isn't being conducted, it's always useful to compare uh, product EPDs. Agree, uh, but anyway, I I thank the team for sharing uh, the memo to highlight everything that you're you're doing on this project. And thanks for your input, Elaine. Was there anything further? No. Oh, okay. Um, unless there's any other questions from the board. Um. I was going to suggest um, if we could to move on to um, sort of an update on where things uh, stand with the Conservation Commission. Um, I know Chuck Tarone is here. He's the vice chair of the Conservation Commission. So I just wanted to, um, in case he needs uh, the rest of his evening back, just to, um, if we could go over there where, go. how things went the hearing in April with the Conservation Commission and then sort of what the next steps are. Uh, th thank you, uh, Chair Klein. Um, so, yeah, I'm Chuck Taroni. I'm uh, Vice Chair of the Arlington Conservation Commission. And the Conservation Commission had its first meeting on uh, March 16th. And um, we had a good, uh, a good discussion, but we continued that meeting till the 13th and scheduled a site visit for this Monday. And um, we also posted that meeting. And uh, so it's a public meeting. And if um, some of the committee, the CBA wants to come to this meeting at 5.30, we, uh, you know, you're welcome to, to join us. Uh, so, um, and I think they're gonna return to our meeting if I have the dates right on the 20th. So um, April 20th will be our second meeting. And that's when we're gonna uh, consider what we've seen on the site visit and, you know, discuss what we asked for, um, as noticed, uh, at least in the presentation when they were here at our first meeting. So that's the schedule coming up. Um, really just kind of the intro and then a site visit. So, yeah, I, I actually think that we're coming back on the 13th. And so we have the availability of the 20th if we have to, um, because we, you know, we're trying to coordinate that the concoms work be completed prior to April 30th. Um, so I got to double check that, Chuck, but I think I think we are coming back on the 13th. Yeah, we continue to April 13th. That's right. Okay. And then we have the, if necessary, we could come back the following week to wrap things Which would up. be the 20th, right? Exactly. Or the following meeting, yes. That's yeah. And so um, the expectation is that um, if an order of conditions issues, um, under the State Wetlands Protection Act, it's it's going to contain a lot of standard conditions and perhaps some special conditions. 
uh, that I'm sure the ZBA is going to want to uh, include and conform in connection with the local bylaw order of conditions. So we're trying to stay coordinated um, uh, as we committed to both boards um, some time ago. Great. Uh, I think I think that's possible. It sounds like uh, if if uh, depending on the very next meeting, if if things come together at that meeting, I think that schedule works. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Um, I have a question. If if this goes to the twentieth, or I'm I'm trying to draw a distinction in my mind between the the uh, conservation commission coming to its conclusion and actually having all of the conditions written and ready to go so that we can immediately deal with them. And I'm wondering if the space between whenever the conservation commission sort of gets to its end to when it actually has all the conditions written, maybe that's the same time. But trying to understand what gap there'll be because we'll be under the under a very tight deadline to mm -hmm. respond if there are any questions and so forth because we go into hibernation as soon as the uh, the hearing is closed and we're in deliberation. So I guess the question is really: Do you expect as as of that final date on the twentieth, say, to have all of the conditions finalized so that we can just react to them uh, or will there still be work to do to, to do to get it papered and so that it's it's ready to go uh so for the conservation commission i believe after the meeting on the 13th we're going to work um with a with a group to put our conditions together and then present them to the conservation commission to be approved so that for us should should finalize um, the hearing on the 20th. So we should be able to finalize it on that day. And this is, again, this is the plan. This is what we're hoping to do if if everything works out. If, um, yeah, so ho hopefully uh, there's no, there's no, uh, you know, hiccups in the, in the system. Great, thank you. Are there any other questions from the board? Okay, seeing none. Chuck, thank you so much. Appreciate your joining us this evening. I did have a question about um, uh, some of the, the uh, February 17th. Are you guys going to uh, discuss not just the architecturals, but some of the, the outside uh, elements? And one I wanted to bring up was about the fence. And I guess there was a comment in here how they might not make uh, meet the um, performance standards of the riverfront area. And it seemed like they weren't going to allow habitat movement. So I, yeah. I just want the applicant to understand that if, if the fence uh, prevents that and there's segmentation within the habitat area, I mean, you're going to have this beautiful urban forest, but from what I read, it sounded like you're going to isolate it and prevent anything from getting in to enjoy it. I'm not talking about, you know, humans. I'm talking about the we wildlife. Have, so, um, know, Mr. Chairman? There, there's going to be a gap. There's going to be a gap of, of at least four inches. And we'll, we'll, if we have to modify that by, by the okay. working with the conversation to, to allow for movement. Um, that was always um, uh, anticipated and is built into it. And we'll, we'll clear that up with the Conservation Commission at its next hearing as well. Okay, great. I just wanted to clear that up so it wasn't hanging out there. Yeah. All right, I appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Hey, um, Paul. What did you want to go to next? Well, what I, I it it may be a, a feel a little cumbersome, but I think it would be very beneficial for us to 
sort of walk through with the board uh, the different subject matters of of the various conditions so we could see, you know, uh, where we have a meeting of the minds, where we may not have a meeting of the minds, and 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 um, we could have some feedback um, so that um, the person charged with doing a draft And I could, we could just walk through this list, and I think it'll become self-evident um, what I'm, what I'm wanted, thinking. Okay. Did you want to do that first, or did you want to talk about the changes to the construction management plan? Um, uh, yes, sir. Uh, Steve Moore, uh, I know that you talked about public comment coming later, but public comment mm -hmm. pertaining to the sustainability plan, does that need to wait? Um, let me just check on one thing with Mr. With Mr. Feldman. Did you want to, if, because if we, if we talk about the construction plan, I think then we could talk about the construction management plan and then we could do public comment for all of that material before we move on. Um, but I wasn't sure if you wanted to do the construction management now. Um, well, I think that, um, we weren't intending to, uh, present the plan other than to report on what okay. we what we've Fair. done in connection with that plan because we we still wanted to get the feedback from the town engineer our expectation is if hopefully we're going to reach a meeting of the minds with the town officials on the construction management plan and then we would present the plan as vetted with town officials uh, to the ZBA. So you've already seen the construction management plan um, and, and, and just to finish the subject. So we, uh, after presenting it to the zoning board and, and, and getting the feedback of um, Sean Reardon from Tetra Tech, which we greatly appreciated, um, we then um, reached out to the various town departments that you know, have jurisdiction and will ultimately uh, have to agree with um, construction management. And it was basically the town engineer, the building inspector. We had a um, uh, a meeting of department members with uh, Mr. Reardon. And I, if I remember correctly, Mr. Klein, you attended and uh, got feedback from everyone. And um, one of the biggest takeaways that the town engineer um, requested of us is we had planned for our construction management plan had had planned for the public right of way to be disrupted and 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 and, and closed for a period of about 18 months um and the um, town engineer felt that that was a, uh, a very, very long time and really wanted um, that time period studied um, and really wanted to understand and, and feel like we justified the need. And, um, and he really felt that uh, it would be unnecessary to um, close the right of way, the public right of way portions for that period of time. And he really wanted us to go back to the drawing board and look at that. And since having that meeting and getting that feedback, um, we did go back with Vanessa, our um, traffic consultant, and um, work, work through with Maggiore uh, from a construction point of view, exactly, um, you know, or more precisely, when do we really need to occupy the public way? And we have submitted materials to the town engineer and, and some others to consider, which um, reduced the time period to no more than 12 months. And the reason why I say no more than 12 months is that the anticipation is that all of the uh, initial site work, the clearing of the site, the demo, um, the the uh, prep preparation of the grade, uh, the installation of the foundation, up through the pouring of the slab of the garage level, um, that can be accomplished um, without occupancy of any portion of the public way totally 
based on the boundaries of the private property. And it would be only after that point, which we anticipate is about a three month process, when we would um, begin to um, erect steel and get the podium going, that we would, um, uh, for deliveries and, and other reasons, need to occupy the public way. And then when we look through the time period to complete the construction and the exterior of the building, and when we uh, felt confident that we can um, uh, return the public way, rebuild the sidewalk, we're rebuilding the sidewalk the entire, uh, 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 from lot line to lot line, when we felt that we could do that, um, we were confident that that period of time would be no longer than 12 months. Uh, quite possibly, it would be uh, um, um, less less than that. But we we were prepared to commit that it would be no longer than twelve months. And even though the construction would then continue continue for uh, a few months thereafter um, to finish interior work and to deal with uh, the um, uh, urban uh, garden and and the like. So. Um, we're again, as we've always, uh, we've tried to be responsive to what we hear. We try to meet in the concerns that 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 are presented to us, and uh, that's where we are with the construction management plan. And um, as soon as we get some additional feedback from uh, the town departments, our uh, plan was to present hopefully what was a final version back to this board, go through the changes. Um, uh, with with the board, and um, and see if there's any other loose ends that needed to be addressed. Great, right. thank you. Okay, so we should <clears throat> we we'll need to go ahead and make sure that we schedule that meeting before too long. Um, to review with the uh, with engineering. Um. There was one other topic before we move on to uh, public comment and uh, discussion of waivers and, and possible conditions. Um, and that has to do with the historic status of the building at 1021 Massachusetts Avenue. Um, so this the, the town maintains uh, a, a register of historically significant buildings of which 1021 Massachusetts Avenue is part um, 1025 Massachusetts Avenue is not, um, and so there was a an application, a demolition permit was requested um, from the Historic District Commission back in 2021. That was put on the Historic Commission docket for um, uh, September 7th, 2021, and at that time, um, a as noted in the the minutes of the the historic commission, that uh, a message was received to postpone this hearing to October fifth, two thousand twenty one, um, but that hearing was never resumed, um, and so you know, now obviously we are a year and a half past that, um, and so I've had conversations with the. Some members of the historic commission and with town council and with inspectional services about what that means in terms of the status of that application um and as as far as the the building department is concerned um the under state statute the historic commission has 30 days from uh to render a decision and it did not render a decision within those 30 days and it did not um, there's no record of any ex extension of that time period. Um, and so what it appears is that the um, there was no demolition delay entered on that building. Um, it um, was they requested demolition was constructively approved because there was no decision granted. And as such, um, the board does not need to, issue specifically um, a waiver in regards to um, waiving the demolition delay requirement. Um, the board, if the, I will have this discussion with, with council one more time, just to confirm um, that, the, that the waiver is the, that denying the waiver 
is appropriate in this case. Um, it may make sense for us to uh, maintain the waiver um, if the if the board so chooses. But I just wanted to um, to bring that up. So uh, as far as our understanding is, the um, there is no demolition delay on this property, and the request to um, in front of the historic commission has lapsed. And, that's and, where, and that's my I, 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 I would concur with that in analysis. And, you know, again, being a lawyer, I like to do belts and suspenders. I, I would still ask the board to waive because I, I, I want to give some confidence to the um, community that we did look at the um, historic um, uh, record that the town has for 1021 Mass Ave. And, you know, it's on your inventory list and there's some records and there there are two drivers that um, having done this um, and in other communities, um, and it's the same situation in Arlington, there are two drivers that historic looks at. Um, one is architectural features. Is there something unique about the structure architecturally, historically, um, that uh, uh, there should be a delay in demolition to give an, an opportunity for, for preservation? Um, the other is, is the, uh, the site itself uh, been the subject of um, in, important historic moments in uh, you know the history of our nation or the history of the of the community, and when we looked at the records of um, of ten twenty one to try to get a better understanding of why the town listed it on its historic inventory, uh, what we found was that there was there was no uh, architectural. Um, uh, historic architectural features that were identified. Uh, that section of the form was completely left blank. Um, I asked Mr. Mulhern and he could speak to it as an architect familiar with this stuff. When he looks at that structure, is there something that that's unique or or something that would give rise to him with his eye for preservation purposes? He indicated, no, it's definitely not the case. It's a fairly standard um, um, uh, building type. It just was built um, in like uh, 1875, but it's from an architectural point of view, it's there's no historic features of any significance. And when we looked at the section of the uh, inventory uh, form about, um, you know, the historic use, uh, all that was noted was it was owned in the 1800s by the Owens family and the they, Owens family were, had a funeral, home, a funeral home business at that property for a number of years. Uh, again, not the type of, um, uh, I, I'm, I'm involved in a development site where um, we have a general from the Rev Revolutionary War who had a homestead on this site. And, you know, that's the, the nature of the, you know, the, the General Glover was his name. And so, you know, that has created a lot of um, important considerations for how we've been moving on developing that site. So I, I want to give some comfort to the community that um, while this property shows up on the inventory for the town, um, our, our, uh, I'm presuming this, it is merely because it happens to have been built in the late 1800s. Um, but when you look at the, the, the materials as to, you know, why it would be deemed significant, there's virtually no reasons um, um, presented. So I don't want anybody to feel like we are, you know, wiping out an important piece of history, either architecturally or in terms of the occupants, um, because uh, um, in looking at it, that that's not the case. And and I think people can feel comfortable that there really is an historic significance other than it happened to have been built in the late 1800s. Um, so I, I know that's all probably unnecessary, but I, I do think it's important that we did we did take a look and um, and make sure we weren't missing something that we should pay attention to. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I would just so, um, just briefly, so uh, 
the Arlington Historic Commission published a book called the Millbrook Valley, a historical and architectural survey that includes all the properties in this general area. Um, and its record for 1021 Massachusetts Avenue identifies it as a dwelling, Greek revival, third quarter of the 19th century, much altered. And that's the, right. that's, that's all it says. That's the totality of it, exactly. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, so I feel a little bit uncomfortable actually about the, the conversation that we've had for the last several minutes. Um, if I was actually feeling good about the belts and suspenders when I thought what it meant was that if there's any doubt about the question of, of essentially the constructive approval of the demolition and the argument that the chairman originally made, uh, we'd want to erase that so that there's no possibility of some later litigation or or fussing about it, uh, we have the power to waive it. And if we think that uh, the, the historic commission is out of is is basically out of the picture because of that, um, I would not want. If there's any question about that, I'd like to put that question to rest so that we have finality. Um, I'm not very comfortable though at listening to one side of the story about. Uh, the significance of the property. I, I get the argument. I'm persuaded by the argument, but I haven't really heard the other side if there is another side. And if we're expected to rely upon the discussion that we've just heard, I would like to make sure that the Historic Commission, if they have a different view, um, would have the opportunity to present that view to us, uh, not by having a hearing and going through a process that we think has been, uh, is procedurally no longer appropriate, but again, if I'm not ready to make a finding that, in fact, there's no historic significance and no basis for claiming that there is, unless the Historic District Commission has uh, has had a chance to weigh in, it it may have some thoughts that we haven't heard, and uh, and I want the record again. If we're going to consider that, I'd like the record to reflect their views uh, as well as the views of the applicant. Thank we you. have time. Yeah. We could invite them. We can invite them to make a submission, to either to come, a written submission, or whatever. Um, but I'm a lawyer too, and and making decisions when you only hear from one side is the sort of thing you do with temporary restraining orders, not the sort of thing you do after all of the months that we've had on this. Okay, Mr. Chairman, can I chime in here as well? Yes, please. Uh, I just wanted to, to clarify that what this board would be doing in this circumstance would not be to waive the, the requirements under the historic district. Um, instead, what you would be doing would be issuing the permit that would determine that the um, demolition delay is not required. You are the local permit granting authority for all local permits under Chapter 40 v So I, I do think that uh, Patrick's comments are well taken which is that you should go through the process of receiving information and making the appropriate finding and then actually issuing this permit as part of your comprehensive permit if it's determined that that is necessary because it already hasn't already been constructively granted. Thank you, that's very clarifying. So in that case, um, Make a note to to reach out to the historic commission and ask them for comment. And just for the record, what I was um, reporting to the zoning board was materials uh, was from reviewing materials that were on file. Uh, with the historic commission about this property. And there was nothing listed of architectural significance. And I mentioned what was listed about the, the historic occupants that, that mm -hmm. I obtained that information by looking at the records of the file of the historic commission. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. DuPont. Um, so just a 
a clarification for Mr. Haverty. So the issuance of the demolition permit as part of the comprehensive permit, in your view, would be based primarily on the fact that there was constructive approval? No, no, no. <clears throat> what I'm saying is that the, if there is a determination that the board you know, needs to take action on this because there was no constructive approval or that it's not clear whether there was a constructive approval, that that should be part of the, the permit that the board issues. It should not be a waiver. Understood. I just, just to be clear, because I'm wondering, is there is there enough of a record for us to look at from the uh, Historic District Commission to actually conclude that there has been constructive I, uh, approval? I think Patrick's point was that there currently isn't, and he would like to see that information submitted. I see. So it's not just whether we're looking at it from the uh, significance of it as a historic site. We're also looking at it from the perspective of what action the uh, commission did or did not take. Yeah, I believe that's correct. Okay. Uh, 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 one clarification, if I may, yeah. if I may, for the benefit of the public. Um, the the only um, issue regarding um, a building listed on the inventory is whether there will be a delay in demolition. It is not whether or not the building can be demolished. The building um, can be demolished. There's no prohibition or restriction. The question is, is there a delay so that there is an opportunity for others, members of the town or other interested parties to um, try to determine if there is a basis to preserve the building and they want to go through that either the town or the third party wants to go through the time and, ex and expense of preservation. Um, so when we talk about issuing a demolition permit, that's not exactly the issue. The issue is whether or not the, um, there is a need to um, wait up to nine months to delay demolition. Um, and it's the demolition delay that we're asking this board um, to uh, determine is not necessary in this case. So it, I don't want people to think that you guys are have the power to say this building can't be demolished. That's not the that's not the issue. Right. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, so one of the things that is sort of odd in, in this context is that we're discussing about the significance of an action a year and a half ago as to whether or not to delay this for nine months. And of course, it's been delayed for nine months. It's been delayed for more than nine months. Uh, now, not necessarily under a circumstance that's giving rise to other people to just try to figure out whether there's a reason for for uh, uh, preserving it. Uh, so maybe it, that doesn't count. But I'd like to have some understanding about what the significance is of worrying about an action a year and a half ago on whether there should be a demolition delay of nine months. Can you clarify that for me? I just, understand what you're saying. I'm sorry. I'm just saying that there's already if if the if the historic district commission had decide had heard the case on October 5th and had decided that yes, there should be a demolition delay that would have expired six months ago. Um, right. And so, in some ways, from one way of looking at it is that it's moved that that you know in effect there's been a delay of that and a lot longer. And what's the significance of that? And I see that there's a potential distinction, but I, it it does make me feel odd about dealing with sort of ex post facto with the delay that that had they granted it, it would have already expired by now. Hmm. Thank you. I appreciate that. Anything further from the board on this question? 
not, then before we move on to um, the review of the requested waivers and the review of potential conditions, um, for Mr. Moore's comment, I think it, it is valuable to do, uh, to hold public comment at this time of the hearing. Um, Oh, where's my little speech? So uh, public questions and comments are taken as they relate to the matter at hand and should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing our decision. Members of the public will be granted time to ask their questions and to make comments. Members of the public who wish to speak should digitally raise their hand using the button on the participant tab in the Zoom application. And those calling in by phone, please dial star nine to indicate you'd like to speak. You'll be called upon by the meeting host. You'll be asked to give your name and address and you'll be given time for your questions and comments. All questions are to be addressed through the chair. Please remember to speak clearly. Uh, anyone wishing to address the board a second time during any particular hearing, the chair will allow those wishing to speak for the first time to speak first. And once all public questions and comments have been addressed, or we have reached the time of 9 p.m., uh, the public comment period will be closed. So with that, are there members of the public who wish to address this board? Mr. Moore. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I just uh, figured that public comment made more sense before you start to get into the conditions. That may be a lengthy discussion. Um, I appreciate that. Sorry, yeah, name, my, uh, name and address. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Um, I uh, wanted to comment briefly on the sustainability plan. And um, this uh, is something I think we may have asked about before. So I'm, I'm, I'm raising it here for a uh, Final time, uh, I uh, I saw that there, uh, under the uh, watering section of the sustainability plan, it says that uh, trees will be hand watered until established, and there will be nominal irrigation provided for the lawn to sustain it. Um, and I I, I want to raise the point again about how um, young trees need uh, significant water to get established and it has to be not irregular but a very regular thing uh, further uh, adult trees uh, particularly in conditions of drought even with drought tolerant species um, conditions like occurred over the last summer um, adult trees will stress out and decline and perhaps even die if not uh, watered um, and I would like to again bring up the issue of irrigation of the trees, both in front of the building, which has been expanded, and behind the building in what is now going to be kind of an urban forest idea of uh, the installation of an irrigation system. Could the applicant comment on that? Thank you, Mr. Moore. Uh, Mr. Mulhern? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Moore, uh, we are planning to install irrigation both in front of the building and in back of the building. And the goal is to find that right balance between the use of the water resource and keeping the plant material alive. We are uh, largely native species uh, plant material. We're, we're not using, uh, lawn is a misnomer here. We're not using uh, turf type uh, plant solutions. Uh, we're using, uh, much more natural solution. So I think we'll we'll be okay on that. And we are, with the irrigation, I think we'll be able to hit that right balance between water use and keeping everything looking green. Yeah, let me, let me, let me just add, because Matt Maggiore has spoken to this issue both at CONCOM and, and, and previously uh, during the ZBA. 
um, there is going to be uh, irrigation of, of the urban park and the front of the building. It, it's going to it's going to have uh, drip irrigation ca capabilities um, as a way to help manage um, you know water resource. Um, you know, it's not like sprinkler head just you know <laughs> sprinkling water that evaporates. It's the idea is to use a drip irrigation system and. Um, when we get to the conditions part, it happens to be under the topic of landscaping. It, it, it happens to specifically remind everyone irrigation provided. So we 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 have committed, and we will accept the condition that specifies that the the uh, the urban park and the and the uh, front of the building, the trees in the front of the building, will will have irrigation. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Moore? Yes, thank, thank you for that spe specificity. I was just thrown by um, thrown by the idea of hand watering because historically that hasn't gone particularly well. Um, yeah, that, that, that wasn't well drafted in that particular document. You know, we didn't we didn't do a good job on that. OK, no, that's fine. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, one last thing I'd like to mention quickly, um, I I wasn't at the CONCOM. I know there was a lot of discussion about uh, concern about trees, I've been told anyway, but it's all secondhand and anecdotal because I was not there. Um, and uh, one of the concerns that was raised, I believe, by Ms. Evans in a letter that you have received via email or, or hard copy, folks have generally received the information about a request for some additional street trees since this is um, unfortunately a, a, a bad area that way. And I was wondering if the um, if the applicant had taken on had any thoughts related to the addition of um, some some street trees. Perhaps uh, I know right now there's going to be four in front of the building, which is excellent, four or five, and that's good. Uh, if down the street there there may be the possibility of adding for perhaps four more two on each side, and if it can't go onto the sidewalk because of uh, potential sidewalk disruption perhaps uh, the back of the sidewalk. Are there any thoughts the applicant has had related to that? Yeah, I I, um, I, I, I I will raise it again with the applicant, but my understanding is we're up to six trees, by the way, I think if I remember correctly in the, okay. the front of the, the building you, right Chris. now, but um, I, I uh, Chris can correct me if I'm wrong about that, but the, the applicant doesn't think it's appropriate for it to start planting trees along other people's property, either in the public right way or um, on other people's properties, uh, as a result of this project, uh, it, that's you know, we 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 um, uh, the 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 applicant feels like it's it's trying to go above and beyond mm -hmm. um, to address um, what everyone is trying to accomplish with this site and this redevelopment and it, the important resource of trees and. I don't think it has an intent to start planting trees along along Massachusetts Avenue um, on either other people's property or in the right of way, which really should be the responsibility of the municipality. So I'll revisit it, but that was my understanding, um, and I don't think it was specifically addressed at the um, at the concon because that particular issue didn't. I don't think we responded to publicly. It didn't. The opportunity didn't present itself. Uh, Paul, just to clarify, we have five uh, street trees across oh. the front. There's uh, mm -hmm. three here, and then three on the other side, two flanking the entrance there. So I should have uh, relied on Mr. Moore knowing how many trees were going in. <laughs> but that uh, what what. Uh, our landscape architect reports is that we're maxed out on our footprint because yep. of the spacing that we need and the driveway that we need and, and getting a little bit of a, a public amenity area there. So we've got as many as we can fit at this point. Right. Uh, Mr. And then one final comment. Yes, please, Mr. Moore. Um, yeah, thank, thank you for that. I, I appreciate the consideration of it. I'm just thinking that with all the concern about the tree loss, particularly of the uh, large mature ones that have to come down to build this building, because there are some very large mature ones that are not compensated by new plantings for about 30, 35 years, that this might be one way to alleviate some of the concern that you're getting 
from the public on that. Almost a goodwill offer. That's all I'm saying, sir. So, right. so I, I appreciate it, Mr. Moore, and I'll report to Matt Maggiore that this subject came up tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Thank you, Mr. Feldman. Are there other members of the public who wish to address the board? Do not see anyone else. One last opportunity for public comment at this time. Seeing none, I'll go ahead and close public comment at this this point in the meeting, and we Mr. will move Chairman. on. To Mr. Chairman, Mr. Hanlon. Oops, sorry, Mr. Hanlon. I, um, I would like at some point earlier on in the proceedings, there had been a considerable amount of discussion about negotiations that were going on with the uh, con with the condo association um, of the large development that surrounded this for changes or for things that were going to happen in the conservation area that had not yet had not yet gelled and uh, it was portrayed to us that those were fairly significant in terms of the public benefit of the project um, and somehow or other I've been asleep at the switch because I don't remember ever actually getting a report on how those negotiations came out and what exactly was being proposed. And while I'm not suggesting that we deal with that the second, um, and we're about to go to a different issue, um, I'd like to at least to have a summation of where that stands and to what extent that um, that is part of the public amenity of the project. It's sort of, it goes along with the, uh, with the, the uh, park, the, uh, uh, forest idea, but it was at least represented earlier that that was probably more significant than any, any of the rest of the, of the stuff that was going on back there. And I have i don't have clear in my mind what it is that was agreed on and what is proposed to be done. The paper that we have, since it's not on the property, uh, the drawings that have to do with the property don't usually go there. Uh, so anyway, I, I, it seems to me that we should we should have an understanding of that as we go forward. I'm imagining that Mr. Tironi has more of an understanding than I do, since it kind of fits within the CONCOM jurisdiction. But uh, it's it's something that we'd like to know a little bit more. I would like to know a little more about. I, I could report and and um, and respond to Mr. Hanlon right now because, um, uh, in fact. Um, um, it's going to come back to this board when we're done with CONCOM because under the local CONCOM permit, you're going to see it. So I'm, I, in two minutes, I could I could bring everybody up to date if if that's the if that's the desire. Um, I, Mr. Moore had raised his hand again, just as I was closing public comments. So I did want to just touch base with him first, and then we'll come back to you, Mr. Feldman. So, Mr. Moore. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for a second. I, I apologize. I was not able to get back to the hand feature quick enough. And the only the only thing I wanted to say in addition to what I said before is I want to again state for the record that the applicant has been, um, I think, quite amenable to changes and suggestions related to trees and vegetation. Um, I don't, although I tend to come across as sounding adversarial. I don't want that to be thought of that way because I think um, this particular project has been um, quite positive in terms of sort of call and response and and uh, and uh, trying to address concerns that are raised. I just wanted to state that for the record. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Thank you, Mr. Moore. You should uh, So, Mr. Feldman, if you could give us a little bit of an update on the um the uh, restoration along the brook. Yes. Yeah, so before we started the um, comprehensive permit process with the ZBA, um, we actually had um, uh, some informal public meeting with the Conservation Commission to get some fee some early feedback because we knew we needed an order of conditions. We knew we were in the riverfront area. And one of the... Um, pieces of feedback that the Conservation Commission gave us was that they really wanted us to make an effort 
to see if we can get permission to do some mitigation along Mill Brook um, behind the property, behind the uh, uh, parking area that's right immediately behind the development site, um, between the parking area and and the mill and Mill Brook itself. Uh, that area, you know, it it has invasive species. It has it has some garbage and other things, and and it's in in need of mitigation. And and the conservation commission expressed that that mitigation in that area would be particularly beneficial to the riverfront resource because it would be right adjacent to the uh, to the bank and. We said we would make effort to communicate with the owner of that property to see if we can um, work something out. Um, months went by in our efforts to uh, reach the Millbrook condominium and 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 make some progress. But Matt Majuri is a pretty tenacious guy, and and he didn't let go, and he worked at it. And uh, we, I, I could, I could say to this board, and as I said to the Conservation Commission. We have fully negotiated an access agreement with the uh, Millbrook Condominium Trustees that control the um, um, common area that includes this piece of, of land uh, to allow us to come onto the property to undertake uh, a restorative program um, and um, our landscape architect in connection with the um, order of conditions filing has a planting plan um, for this "quote unquote" offsite location on the Millbrook Condominium, um, for which are the, for which which is part of the subject matter of our order of conditions, and um, the we do not have the access agreement executed yet. Um, it's been fully negotiated. Council, myself, and the condominium board's council have agreed to the text. It's in final form and it's out for execution, but we didn't have it. We were requested to by the Conservation Commission to submit it when we had it. And we perfectly said we would be happy to. Um, and uh, since the meeting that we had with the Conservation Commission, I've reached out to council. Matt Maggiore has reached out to the trustees of the condominium. Can we get this signed up? We'd like to get it into the town. And um, we, 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 we got feedback. Yes, we've been busy. We'll, we'll attend to it. So the, that, that's a long-winded way of saying that we believe we have reached agreement to be able to access our abutters property to allow us to um, undertake mitigation along Mill Brook. Um, we've had our landscape architect and our wetland scientists put, to, put forth a mitigation plan, which is part of what the Conservation Commission is looking at. And that access allows us to uh, come back onto the property for at least two years to be able to maintain and make sure that a, a, a planting dies, that we can replace it. And they've given us permission for us to do that for two years. So um, we were able to accomplish something that was expressed to us by the Conservation Commission informally as something that they thought uh, would be an important piece of mitigation and asked us to try to accomplish. and. Um, we're at the one yard line to being able to do it. Great. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, so then with that, um, does it make, Mr. Feldman, does it make more sense to you to uh, review the waiver list first or talk about the potential conditions first? I, I think we should just run through the conditions first, um, if, if if it's okay. I, I, I'd really like to, um, uh, I, I think you'll you'll get the, the what I'm trying to accomplish. So I, if, if it's okay, I'll, I'll share my screen. You tell Great. me if I did it correctly. I'm not usually a big screen sharer, but do you, do you see this uh, Word document right here? We do. Okay. Yeah. So as I said, um, the chair was kind enough to um, put together an email of a, of a list of conditions that um, that the that the chair uh, had 
notes on, and um, I've gone through that and uh, added some, and I've, I've clarified the language, and I just thought we could quickly walk through them. Um, so the, the, the subject matters are, uh, as presented here, is that there was a condition that was contemplated uh, regarding sustainability. And um, the, uh, uh, the commitments that we have made as the applicant that can, that can be presented in the form of a condition that we're acknowledging is agreeable to us is that it's an all electric building except backup power generator. Um, uh, Mr. Klein had the the stretch code reference. You know the the, the uh, we we went through that tonight. Um, um, the applicable stretch code we're going to comply with. Um, enhanced uh, envelope uh, was a term that Mr. Klein had, and what I understood that to mean from my notes was that we committed that the building facade was going to be. Uh, uh, and I don't know how to pronounce this, Natichha brand siding panels. And that's a particular uh, manufacturer of a high quality siding, uh, uh, siding panel to the envelope to the building. And uh, we're committing to that particular brand. And uh, um, uh, Mr. Klein uh, had reference to uh, Albedo, which I which I understand is reflective materials, and we've committed to a uh, a white roof. So um, we fully expect there to be condition uh, a condition on sustainability goals. I wanted a oops, I wanted to um, you know sort of put some detail as to how, what we understood that to be, so that the board had the benefit of our thinking on that. The next subject, uh, uh, again, it's the latter part of the list where you'll see stuff from, from, from us, but the next subject Mr. Klein had in his notes was lighting, no uh, up lighting, no spillover. That's correct. We we're agreeing to that. There'll be no up lighting. The, we gave you the photo metric plan. There'll be no spillover. So we ex fully expect a condition on that. The next item Mr. Klein had was the urban park uh, public access. Uh, I've said it previously. I want to um, say it again tonight that we're not able to agree to public access for the urban park or the urban garden. Um, it doesn't work uh, from from uh, from our perspective. It's primarily a liability concern, um, and. Um, um, it, we don't believe that would be an appropriate condition, and we would urge the uh, uh, board to consult with council about uh, a condition that the appropriateness of a condition that requires that. Um, landscaping, um, again, was the subject matter. There's, there's a lot to landscaping, and and um, you'll see later later on that obviously we fully expect our permit to be conditioned upon our plans, which includes the landscaping plan, which includes the schedule of, of planting. So th there, there's, a, there's, there, there's going to be a requirement uh, that we um, perform in accordance with that landscaping design plan. Um, in terms of maintenance costs, um, that's going to be the responsibility of the condo association. It's going to be built into our condominium documents. And the question came up during the hearings about annual reporting to the ZBA and the CONCOM, and we committed to the board, we committed to the CONCOM that uh, we will do a 10-year annual report. Um, I, 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 I know, I just know from doing this for 40 years, I've never had an applicant agree to 10 years of um, annual reporting um, on, on, um, on the landscaping, in particular the urban park. But the applicant is going to do that because the urban park is an amenity and a feature that is important that it gets established. And we wanted to uh, demonstrate to the board that we're committed to see that happening. Um, there was a question about water flow at the side lot lines. Um, you, you'll see my note here addressed in the civil grading plans. Um, you may recall from the last presentation um, um, by um, Patriot Engineering that the grading has been carefully done along the uh, both the Butters property to ensure that there will be no water flow that 
uh, exits our property onto the abutters property, you know, from the sides. And that's addressed in the civil plan. So once we have a condition that the project is going to be built in accordance with our plans, I think that issue is covered by that. Um, native species and, and cultivars, that, that's again in the schedule. So I think that issue is covered. It doesn't need to be called out as a special condition, but it's, it's going to be required by our plans. And you'll see here irrigation provided. Uh, uh, that was in <laughs> that was written before I spoke to Mr. Moore, but we had committed to irrigation. Um, the next topic was bike parking, um, lift assist above floor storage. Um, I have a question mark. We didn't exactly know what was meant by that comment. So one of the feedbacks when, when we're done going through this that we'd like from the board is what what that's referring to. Um, uh, fencing, less opaque uh, gap below for animals. Um, yes, there will be a gap below for animals, no question about that. But on the issue of less opaque, um, the applicant has presented a, uh, a white vinyl fence with a wood grain. Um, I, we, we, we talked about this with the applicant, and this is one where, um, alternatively, if the board would prefer a cedar fence with, you know, planks that are have some spacing between them because it says less opaque, meaning you don't want to just see this um, um, solid um, fencing that the applicant is open to doing a cedar fence instead of what was presented. So we just need some feedback. And um, once we get some feedback, then we can, we'll, we'll spec it accordingly onto the plans and then it'll be, that issue will be addressed. Um, you know, uh, Cliff was the one who brought up, uh, you know, should there be an amenity for younger um, residents? There, there's no proposed on-site, you know, play area. Uh, we don't think there's room on the site. Our landscape architect, you know, um, and our wetland scientist wants to preserve what they've designed in the urban garden. Uh, the way it's been designed because it's really for habitat purposes. And I've made the point to the board previously that uh, we presented a fiscal impact study and the expected number of children um, from, uh, um, you know, you know, small children up to 12th grade is only at any one time expected to be six in the entire development. So to, um, uh, some, create some kind of on-site amenity that would likely be barely used and and have that, you know, interfere with the whole um, in, uh, uh, environmental mitigation that, that we're trying to accomplish. Uh, we, we don't have it proposed and we would respectfully request that it's just not necessary. Uh, paving in a pervious versus impervious and directing surface flow toward the planting. That's all been addressed on the civil plans. It's been addressed um, on the um, uh, landscape drawing. So uh, again, I think referencing the plans takes care of this issue. If there's some, some language that, that the board wants, um, it's attorney to call out. We could we could figure that out. Um, there was there was uh, the mid block crosswalk on Mass Avenue, and um, uh, this was uh, uh, one of the comments of the review engineer Tetra Tech was you know there's that mid block crosswalk. We think it should be inspected. We should figure out if there are any improvements necessary. And as you will may recall. Our traffic consultant did just that and um, um, went through all of the um, features. There's proper signage, you know, and, and, and did the inspection, but did say that there is some mitigation uh, necessary. And it was to upgrade the southern wheelchair ramp as required to meet ADA design standards and to install new thermoplastic pavement markings to enhance the sidewalk because it's completely faded. And... Um, the applicant is willing to to have a condition that requires us to make those improvements to the mid block uh, crosswalk um, down. It's about 400 feet uh, down uh, Mass Avenue. 
bus stop improvements, uh, as it's turned out, as we've worked with the ZBA, um, you know that we're, we've created uh, two benches and, on pavers that we showed on the plans and the particular location immediately adjacent to the to the bus stop. And um, again, we can either reference it, you know, by referencing on the plans, they think that issue has been accomplished in the drawings. Um, the subject of parking was identified by uh, Mr. Klein. Um, first, we addressed the issue during construction, and we will accept the condition that says the contractor will inform workers that there is no parking on on private ways, so that there, there'll be a condition of our, of our permit that our contractor has to direct uh, construction workers of that of that uh, and report to them what is the case you can't park on private ways um we we've we've spoken about through the construction management plan that uh, most construction workers on site once the slab goes down will be parking on site on the slab and so there's really not going to be any uh need for uh off-site uh parking even Forget about on the private ways, just generally in in allowed street parking. Uh, the building garage shall be conditioned and ventilated. Um, guests will have street parking available. So I, I don't know if that covers all the items that Mr. Klein had in mind under the subject of parking, but I wanted to get that out there. Um, construction. Um, that's the subject matter. Uh, there was concern about you know our our. Is any work that we're going to do uh, run the risk of, um, of somehow uh, potentially damaging adjacent um, structures? We're quite confident that we don't have any concern uh, that that would happen, but we would accept a condition that says that we have to undertake a survey of adjacent uh, structures pre and post construction so that we document what the condition was before we started construction. You usually do this with a video survey of the basement. You document its condition after the foundation goes in and the slab is down and we're done with our earthwork immediately adjacent to the structures. We go back and you know, re-inspect and do a post-construction to make sure that there was no uh, adverse impact. So if the board feels like it wants to impose a survey condition like that on the applicant in connection with the abutting structure, um, we're willing to accept that condition. Hours of operation, I don't speak to it. I'm sure there's a standard condition that I'm going to see in the draft decision about what, what the construction hours are. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll abide by it. It's usually you can't get started before seven in the morning and you have to end, I don't know what time at night, but, and there's some construction that can be happening on a Saturday, not on a Sunday, but I'm sure you guys have that in your permit. Um, this CMP is the construction management plan, uh, use of sidewalk and parking spaces and pedestrian safety and the bike lane protection and the delivery route and the tree protections and the heat island effects. And that's all of those subject matters are set forth in the construction management plan that's been filed with the application. Our anticipation is that, as I reported to the board, when we have a meeting of the minds, hopefully we'll get there quickly, when we have a meeting of the minds with the other town departments, we are going to then present the revised construction management plan you'll see later on in this list we fully expect that to be an exhibit to our permit which is going to require us to um, conform to what's set forth in the construction management plan which addresses all of these subjects so whether or not it has to get written up as a as a big condition i think what what's, what it's, what what the decision is going to need to say is the applicant shall um, perform its construction in accordance with the construction management plan attached here to his exhibit blank because the, the plan lays out detail on all of those conservation the riverfront zone the storage in in the um uh, uh resource areas and conservation commission comments and mitigation changes. Um, as you heard tonight, uh, 
we, we fully expect to get uh, um, conditions set forth in an order of conditions that are usually made up of general conditions and special conditions. And when those are produced, we fully expect that all those conditions are going to become the subject of our permit um, because of the local wetlands bylaw. So conservation and all these issues will be addressed by by the um, conditions set forth in the in the order of conditions. Uh, meter locations, that was a subject on, on Mr. Klein's list. There's a question mark for us. We'd love some feedback. We, we can't quite figure out exactly what that's referring to. Uh, that the uh, affordable, like housing, affordable housing units are gonna be permanently affordable. Uh, absolutely agreed. The applicant expects a condition like that. We know they're gonna be uh, permanently affordable. That's not an issue. Um, and um, I'm, I'm sure either Mr. Haverty or I, I could provide, you know, um, uh, conditions that, that lay that obligation out. Um, here we have the historic, I'm not going to repeat it, we had the discussion tonight, uh, historic waiver, as Mr. Ha Haverty has educated all of us, use of the term waiver is not a good use of that term, uh, so we, I should probably change it right right now and, and just put down historic delay for the moment as a placeholder, and, um, and uh, we, we've spoken about that, we know what that's about. Um, uh, Mr. Klein had a notation on his list about the retail space and, um, you know, we would accept the condition that, you know, obviously um, any retail had to be in accordance with zoning. Um, you know, if there is a particular objectionable um, commercial use that the zoning board feels um, it wants to specifically identify as prohibited. And you know, we're open to to hear what it may be. Um, you know, in 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 the um, uh, in, in in the old days, I'm dating myself. In the old days, a lot of times I would see a a a, a condition that would say you can't have an off track betting you know um uh, venue in 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 a particular location because the community was concerned that off track betting venues you know bring not desirable um um uh, issues to the community so obviously we're going to keep our retail in accordance with zoning but if there is a particular use that the board wants to to consider prohibiting, just let us know, and if we don't object to it, then we'll we'll spell it out as in in our, in our permit. Um, the, there was a topic of rainfall modeling um, that was came up during the hearings, and you know what what were we using? And um, uh, this was also the subject of review comments. The the answer is it's the the NOAA Atlas fourteen plus. This is the most stringent. Um, um, uh, analysis that that can be deployed today, and it's that's been addressed in the uh, stormwater management design. That is that is what we ultimately used in the design that our civil engineer worked with TetraTech and on all the plans that you've seen. It it is deployed this, so um, you don't have to condition us to use that. You just have to condition us to build in accordance with the design that we presented because that design is based on that rainfall calculation. Um, uh, Mr. Klein had the condo docks, town review. I'm adding the question mark. Um, I don't have a particular objection to the town reviewing our condo docks, but having done dozens of condominium projects and I would say dozens of communities. I've I, I never been asked to submit condominium documents for the municipality to review our docs. Um, what I have seen, and 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 uh, if this is what um, what, what uh, Mr. Klein was getting at, or what the zoning board wants to get at, is that our condominium docks will specifically call out and be subject to the comprehensive permit. That's no problem that we will do that anyway, but we will 
we can include a condition that says that the condominium documents for the development shall, shall indicate that um, the development is subject to the comprehensive permits and the conditions set forth in the comprehensive permits. If you want to give us that directive or instruction that that be included in the condo documents, that's perfectly acceptable. I, I, I just, I don't know what happens if I submit condo documents to the town and, you know, um, I don't know what the review is the town's going to do of, of private real estate condominium documents. So I didn't exactly know what you were getting at there. Um, there was the subject of services, delivery, trash, recycling. Um, I, again, I, I, I look back on, on what I had on that and it's all private. It's by the condominium association, like the trash service and everything is going to be, you know, privately done. Um, uh, I don't exactly know what was meant by deliveries, but as the project has evolved, you guys know, we've presented that the, um, access door is substantial it's the drive is 20 feet wide so the ability for a, a typical delivery of a van or something like that uh can easily occur um you know on site um we added a couple that we know had come up during the hearing uh this next one um uh, I, I think it was Tetra Tech who wanted us to do this, and it's a it's a it's a condition that we're uh, agreeable to. The uh, hydrant flow test to determine both static and residual water pressures for the domestic and and fire services. You know, it's a little bit of a technical condition. It's a civil condition, but it was um, it was something that uh, Tetra Tech wanted to make sure that we did when we design our uh, uh, um, water pressure for both fire and domestic. And of course, we'll do that and we'll commit to those flow tests. And then uh, there was something else that was identified in the third party review. And that is that, you know, we're tying in to uh, a sewer and a sewer manhole. And um, we were asked that that manhole, the condition of that manhole should be inspected. And to the extent it is in need of any repair, that we repair that manhole accordingly. So it's not just we're tying in, but we're repairing and fixing the manhole. Um, that that uh, I wrote that down as a condition I was expecting. So I stuck it on the list. Um, uh, obviously, we're, we're going to turn to waivers in a minute, and then uh, as we develop a uh, decision, the exhibits are critical. Obviously, the final architectural plans, civil plans, landscape design plans, and the construction management plan, we would fully expect to be uh, either exhibits or set forth as requirements that we have to build in accordance with those materials. And we've been... Uh, trying to update the board um, regularly, as you saw tonight, so that by the time we get to April 30th, you are looking at a complete and final set that has incorporated all of the feedback and changes that we've made over the last four or five months as we've worked through this process. Thank you for indulging me on that list. There's obviously a few things I'd, I'd love to hear some comments back on, but it's wide open to hear whatever, what anybody on the board wants to say about any of these things. So I appreciate the time. Oh, thank you. Um, just, you, you had come across a couple of questions on my notes. Uh, one was about the bike parking. So the town of Arlington requires that uh, bike parking either be that the, that, that it doesn't require you to have to physically lift the bike yourself. Um, and so there's a provision in the bylaw that if you have raised bike parking, there has to be some assist mechanism to help you raise the, the bicycle. Um, <clears throat> and I know we had we had discussed that briefly uh, months ago. Um, and there, there are several different options for that kind of a device. And usually what it is, is there's just, there's, um, you know, you pull down on a handle, you put your bike on the on something and then you push something up and there's a spring that assists in the lifting of it so that you don't um yeah. you're not so required I, to have to lift fully yourself 
Right. So what we, as you as you recall from the plans, we have a bike room, and that bike room uh, doesn't require any 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 lifts. Um, the bike room has a certain uh, capacity, and what we did to um, address additional capacity is to create you know a, a hanging uh, um, bike, uh, me- you know a hanging rack. Uh, at certain parking spaces within the garage that's associated with um, um, certain parking spaces. And so um, to the extent that there was any other requirements under the local bike law, it it should show up on my waiver list that we were asking for waiver. And if uh, a lift is a requirement for, 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 for those bike racks in the garage, then we would be asking for a waiver for that. Um, I'm not sure where you would store that mechanism and how many of those mechanisms you need and where they would be, uh, how they would be um, used or deployed. But, um, you know, if it's something that's that's portable and we should have one in the bike room that a resident could go and retrieve if they wanted uh, assistance in, in raising their bike, well, that's probably easily accomplishable. I'm not trying to resist that i just i didn't know exactly what that was all about yeah so usually it's actually it's a part of the bike rack itself um and so it, it's not a portable device it's just that the the rack itself is designed so that um there's a there's a spring assist or a pneumatic assist to help uh raise the bike up so that it's um all right, well, let me, I'll check with, I'll check with Majuri about the exact bike rack they were contemplating for those, for that wall hanging unit. So okay. uh, I'll, 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 we'll have the, we'll have the answer of what was contemplated. Maybe that's not an issue at all. Okay. Um, then there was a question about the meter locations. That was just, um, you know, ident- making sure that the plans identify where the gas meter and the electric meter and the water meter where those are going to be located. And, you know, obviously they're not on the front of the building that if they're, um, but they're in a location that is not as prominent. Yeah, I think Chris could speak to that. They're all going to be in the basement. The electric meters will be in the electric room, the water meters for domestic water and the domestic service will be in the water room downstairs and the gas meter will also find a home in the basement exactly where I'm not quite sure yet, but uh, mm-hmm. There'll be nothing, I don't think, anything excepting maybe a little sensor showing on the exterior of the building because the meters are all read electronically these days. And we can indicate the location on the floor. Uh, and then is it permissible to have the disconnects for all of those in the basement as well? Oh, sorry about that. Um, so f- would the disconnects for those services also be in the basement? The disconnects for the electrical service? For the electrical, the ga- the shutoffs for the yes. electrical the, shut off the, 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 the main disconnect for the electrical service will be in the electric room. The shutoff for the gas will be in the uh, at the meter, uh, just upstream of the meter. There'll be a gas valve, and the same with the water. There'll be a shutoff upstream okay. of the uh, water meter to turn the water off for the whole building. Okay. Um, and then the uh, the question about the condo docs for review, I think that was mainly intended if there were any, um, if there was any language that the board was specifically requesting to be included in the condo docs, um, which may have to do with, you know, the location for guest parking, the location, you know, what not, you know, the, reminding guests that they're not allowed to park on private ways, things like that. If there were specific provisions of conditions that the board had about stuff that would go in the condo docs, just that there would be verification that those in fact made it into the docs, but there, there would not oh. be sort of a global review of the docs themselves. Uh, completely understand. Uh, again, I I make, I, I, the, the condominium documents are going to recite that yeah. what this project is and it, how it was permitted and how it's subject to the permit. So it's going to incorporate your entire permit. Um, yeah. But if there's specific language you want us to call out and actually put in the condo docs and you want to make sure that it's there, we'll, we're happy to do that. Great. Thank you. Are there comments from the board? 
Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, first of all, I, I thank uh, Mr. Feldman for having such a, a great list to work on as uh, work on as we, we develop all this. Um, I, I would like it if he could provide a copy of this for the record so that we can remember it. Uh, hundred percent. I, 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 I know, I knew that I was, I, I, I just, I, I'm, I'll absolutely get it into you. So while, while I have you giving us documents, I, the idea of the 10 year reporting requirement is one that when it emerged in conversation several meetings ago, and it was uh, Mr. Feldman's proposal um, on a way of dealing with this assurance that the urban park will actually get established and that will, uh, and that what we hope happens actually does happen. Um, and I would appreciate it if Mr. Feldman could provide us with a sample of the language that he would prefer in seeing this set up. Uh, not that we would necessarily do it exactly the way Mr. Feldman wanted to, but it would be very useful to have that uh, at least as a point of departure in figuring out what our our, our condition uh, would be. Um, and the third thing is I'm quite, I'm intrigued by uh, the idea of the cedar fence uh, versus the, you know, the more opaque uh, style and uh, would be very interested in the opinions of the architects on the board uh, as to what they think of that suggestion. Oh, Mr. Chair? Yes, please. Um, always happy to weigh in on wood versus vinyl. Um, <laughs> the cedar with um, spacing sounds very appealing. I think both from, a, um, you know, ability of animals to move through it, as well as um, just environmental impact. Um, personally, I would recommend cedar. Certainly, I would think that from an embodied carbon point of view, cedar would be better, although that's just an untutored reaction. Yes, that's accurate. Okay, thank you both. Anyway, we're not, we're not asking the board to design our project, but it matters <laughs> to us if we get your feedback and when, when, when we can accommodate, when we have this alternative, it helps to know what the board would prefer, and then we could just do it. No, oh, absolutely. Other other questions or comments from the board? Do not see any. Um, Mr. Chairman, ask Mr. Rear, uh, Mr. Hanlon. I'm sorry. I was hoping to do this at the at the very end, but I I must say that in terms of sustainability. Uh, I think that that I'm very happy to see the proposal that is reflected in 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 Mr. Feldman's notes. There's there's a lot that we don't usually see as as standard conditions. To be sure, some of those things are going to lead right into a requirement that is going to be applicable as a matter of state law anyway. But uh, it it sets a sort of a model for what we do expect out of 40p projects, and uh, and I'm very very happy that the uh, applicant has been uh, so agreeable in in going the extra mile uh, to uh, to to include all that. So uh, it's a matter that's of great importance to the town. Uh, this whole set of issues has been very important, and uh, uh, and again, I'm I'm very happy at the agreeability of the applicant in addressing these issues and. Uh, and uh, agreeing to conditions that that nail them down. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hamlin. Um, I did want to ask Mr. Reardon if he had if any other items came to mind. Just just a couple minor ones. I'm just curious on the generator, what the typical exercising schedule is on that. Uh, generally, it's once a week for about 30 minutes. And we um, we pick a time that we believe will be the least disruptive. Uh, generally it's midday, noontime. Saturday noontime is a typical 
one Wednesday noon time is another one that we've used before, but that, that's the general idea. The board may, just may want to think about considering a condition that stipulates that because um, it is, it's going to have a sound enclosure, but it's going to be close to that hall, that, that building on the west side. And is it, is it, is it positioned outside a unit? It's uh, it's positioned outside a corridor, so there's a, a common corridor that separates the general generator location from residential units on the other side of the corridor. Okay, all right, that's it for me. And everything else, I think, you know, it's been either addressed in past revisions or it's on its way to being addressed based on my conversations with the engineer. Great, thank you. Um. In regards to the the CMP, obviously, so you know the board in the decision would have, you know, it would adopt what's on the CMP. But as we know, as we go through construction, obviously, some of these things need to change and adjust on the fly a little, a little bit. Um, and so the board would usually um, defer to the town if there are specific th things that that need to be addressed on the short order. Um, so I think we would include that in the conditions as well that that would um, that that be the that we would need to determine exactly who the right person would be, whether it's the town engineer, whether it's the inspector of buildings, whether it's uh, uh, emergency services or some combination thereof. But we've definitely done that in the past. Are there other questions or comments in regards Maybe. to the Mr. Mr. Chairman condition? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Just you know, in, in Mr. Hanlon. Just, yeah. I'm, whoops, hold on. I'm trying to un unmute myself. So I was just thinking that that on some of the issues, like for example, the parking condition, we have done this, I think, in both of the applications that we've dealt with in the last couple of years. Um so if there's any, or, I mean, I'm sure that we will, and Mr. Haverty will be looking at what we've already done, and uh, and in some places that that's where th that's that would be our point of departure on some of these issues. Um, and I just encourage the applicant to these these are public documents, and uh, if the applicant looks and sees what we've done in the past, that's probably where we'd start in thinking about these issues now and. It provides it provides a context. I, I they, those have not generally been matters of great controversy in in the past. Things like the bike parking and so on. And uh, um, but in any event, you, it's possible to get concrete because uh, we, we've done some of these things in the past. Uh, fair enough. I'll, I'll get a hold of some of the couple of recent decisions and see how these conditions have been articulated, and if there's anything that seems problematic i could at least at the next meeting point it out um and so again so you at least know where we're coming from before you go into a deliberations absolutely thank you and those paul, decisions are uh, you the, the recent decisions yeah i was going to ask you paul i'd appreciate that thank you so much thank you for that uh, paul. mr old Mike. Uh, just was having one thought on the parking uh, conditions. I know before they had talked about construction workers parking on the slab on grade as their building. And I was just wondering if they've given any thought as to how that's going to work. You know, they're going to have to be accessing the ceiling of that garage um, for construction. And as contractors are parking there and interference with that. Um, so just wanted to make sure that they've thought that through. Um, when it comes to that, that parking, um, you know, on the side of grade as they're building up above it. Yeah, that, that that's a, it's a good comment. Uh, a couple of thoughts on that. You know, as you know, we have 50 spaces and we don't expect um, the number of construction workers on any given day to be in, near that volume. So there's going to be plenty of room on that slab to, to maneuver. And, and, and there may be a, a day or two or there may be occasional days where, you know, the construction workers will park on the street in, in regular appropriate um, 
um, off-street parking. Um, I've made this point before um, in our observations in this particular stretch of Mass Avenue, uh, there always seems to be plenty of vacant um, street parking. It's not, it happens to be not a particularly, you know, crushed area for street parking. So we, we, um, we believe that, you know, almost the majority of the time or even the, the super majority of the time, the ability to park on site is going to be there and available but just because of the numbers of construction versus construction workers versus amount of space we have. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Uh, just, I'm not 100%. It is certainly true that any construction worker who wishes to identify where the private streets are has the ability to do that. Uh, whether they will, in fact, do that consistently is is a question. And it seems to me that that it would be helpful if the applicant were to uh, be clear to the people who will be working on site, what are the private streets? I'm, I'm thinking particularly of the one right across the street that Ms. Evans lives on. But you know, the we all know where those streets are, and the construction workers don't necessarily. And I'd rather I'd rather they be told than mm -hmm. than rely on them reading the signs and 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 understanding where they shouldn't go. So uh, if if that could that would make make it a lot more more palatable to the people who already are concerned that notwithstanding the availability of parking on Mass Ave, that at certain times they get parking on their own streets and and are perplexed about what to do with it. Well, uh, we, we've already put in our list of conditions that I viewed tonight that the contractor will be obligated to inform its workers that there's no parking on private ways and we could add and where the and and particularly inform them what ways we're talking about. Yes, that's that's what I have in mind. And Mr. Chair, if I could add, there's a real convenient way to, to do that. You guys have created a great figure showing um, the truck routes as part of the the uh, construction management plan. You could simply just add a color designated which one, which of the streets on your on that map are, are private streets. That'd be good recommendation. Thank you. Anything further on this topic? Seeing none, why don't we move on to waivers and then after we discuss waivers, we can um, go back for public comment. Um, so Mr. Feldman, do you wanna? I, I don't have, I, I didn't tee up the waiver list. Matt? Um, I, I wasn't, I wasn't, uh, I didn't, I didn't know we were going to tee up the new waiver list. Uh, I could, I could log on to my office and get it. Do you, do you have it handy? I have it here. I thought I was looking at it a minute ago. Ah, here it is. Okay. Yeah, so this is the revision, the March 15th revision um, to the wa waiver list. Uh, so these are the, the waivers that are being requested by the applicant um, in order for the project to be able to move forward. So the first one, uh, the first section, these are out of the zoning bylaw. Um, so one is that the multifamily apartment use is not allowed by right or by special permit in the B1 zone. Um, and so they're requesting a waiver to be allowed to, uh, for multifamily use. I think technically this would be um, not just multifamily, but because it does have commercial, it would be mixed use. That's right. It's It needs to be mixed use for uh, the garage as a separate use and the retail space as a separate use. So the three use groups are R2, uh, S2, yeah. 
and uh, M. Right, but from from a zoning point of view, the the garage is on a separate use. Uh, from a from a from a from a construction point of view, I get it, Chris. But yeah. from a zoning point of view, um, I think the retail is allowed. Um, it's the multifamily that's the problem. But I think you're right, Mr. Klein. We could describe that as mixed use. Um, you know, including multifamily. Um. Then the the second one is the front the front yard setback. So the zone requires a twenty foot setback, and the proposal is seventeen feet. Um, and as we've discussed in prior in a few prior hearings, the building was initially proposed closer to the street. It has been moved uh, closer to conformance with that twenty foot um, requirement. But the request would be to uh, to have the front yard setback be set at seventeen feet. Yeah, and that's the actually the the that's only a, one part of the building. In other words, it's not all seven TV. That's the closest point, and that's why we need the uh, relief. There are parts that are further back. Um, the third one is the bylaw requires a maximum building height of three stories or thirty five feet in the B one district. Um, the proposal is for a five-story building with a proposed height of 66 foot four inches, uh, which is the, the reason for the request for that waiver. Um, and obviously the the reason for the height is the the ink is the the larger number of units um, and able to uh, support the construction and the provision of um, uh, subsidized uh, subsidized cost housing. Uh, number four is uh, the F is the floor area ratio, the FAR, which is the ratio of the area of the lot to the area of the building. Um, and the maximum in this district is 0 0.75, and the applicant is proposing uh, an FAR of 2. Point, is it 2.0? Is that correct? Chris, you're going to know that. I thought it was. I, I, I we check this. I think two is the right number. I think that's right. Okay. Um, then the zoning bylaw for parking, the bylaw requires 1.15 spaces per one bedroom unit, 1.5 spaces per two bedroom unit, and two spaces per three or more bedroom unit. And the applicant is proposing one parking space per unit, regardless of the number of bedrooms. And I believe that the town meeting voted to change that last year. Um, and that I believe it is now all just one space per unit. Um, I just want to make sure I'm, I have that correct. Um, oh, that's bike parking. That's, Wrong table. Loading spaces. So yes, yeah, so that's been changed now. So in the zoning bylaw, single, single family, two family, three family dwelling or apartment building, except public housing for the elderly, is specifically as one space per dwelling unit. So actually, is that is that now in six one four? Is that the same reference, the same uh, section? So that is the six one four. Yes. Okay. I. I um, so uh, when you applied, it hadn't been approved by the AG yet. Oh. And it has now been approved. So um, that sounds like uh, that's that's complying now. That doesn't require a waiver. That is correct. So yes. So you are. In compliance with that one. Um, then uh, the bike bicycle parking design guidelines, uh, which are referenced from the zoning bylaw, the long term bike storage guidelines do not permit hanging bicycle storage. Um, the applicant proposes 49 bike storage units in the basement and 26 hanging racks in the garage um so the 
in the zoning bylaw that has been slightly modified. Where's the language? Um, So it says, uh, so uh, bicycle parking designed in the following manner shall not be permitted unless otherwise allowed by the special permit granting authority upon finding of unusual circumstances. So storage that requires bikes to be laying down are not allowed, but that is not being requested. Bicycles that must be hung with one or both wheels suspended in the air or bicycles that must be lifted off the ground or floor without any physical assistance. So if there is physical assistance, then they are those uh, uh, spaces that are off the floor are compliant. And I will make myself a note to provide you some uh, information on those systems. Would the board be willing to grant a waiver on the lifting? Since we have uh, virtually one per, we have one bike per unit uh, in the basement yep. at 49 and then these other 26 are, uh, we were viewing it as a very straightforward mm -hmm. hanging rack where bracket on the wall and the bike fits on it and you put the bike up if you need it if you're ha if it's the second bike or in your household yeah i think the, the board would need i think to discuss that i know on prior on prior uh comprehensive permit applications we have requested and included in the decisions um the lift assist racks uh mm -hmm. So let me take a let me let me take a look and provide you with some information on those, and then we can discuss that next time. That'd be great. It just seems to me that since we we're not asking for hanging racks for all of the bikes, it's really only a third of the bikes that we're asking for that. It seems like a, if we could get a straightforward rack solution that yeah. didn't require springs or pistons, that would be better. Okay. Thank you. Um. So turn to the second page, the next one here. Um, town bylaw, article, Title V, Article 16, Sections 2 and 4, Tree Protection and Preservation. Uh, these sections prohibit the removal of protected trees unless removal is authorized through the approval of a tree plan. Construction demolition requires the approval of the tree plan prior to, to or concurrent with application for building permit. Protected trees require a payment to a tree fund. And the applicant seeks to remove trees, the majority of which are non-native species, in order to construct the building and complete the waterfront restoration. The applicant seeks that a tree plant approval be included in the comprehensive permit and a waiver of the payment to the tree fund. And the waiver is requested. Absent the removal of trees, the project cannot be constructed. The payment to the tree fund affects the financial viability of the project as significant dollars are already committed to the riverfront restoration plan on the property in along mill brook um so my understanding there so the um the town does require that when there's a, a significant project and there are trees that are within the setbacks the trees either have to be protected or if they're removed there is a mandatory uh payment that must be made uh to the town's tree fund those funds used uh around town to um, plant new street trees and do uh, other tree related work in town. Um, and my understanding from from what we're seeing here is that the the applicant is saying that in lieu of making that payment, uh, they would be doing wetland restoration on the banks of the um, of the mill brook. Is that correct? That's right. I mean, that's part of it. Part of it is also that the uh, that, that the uh, expense of the urban park is is quite substantial. Um, you know, much more than was originally contemplated when the applicant started to endeavor on this project. That it, it never expected that it would have a multi hundred thousand uh, dollar um, tree restoration program, um, and it's it's absorbed it in in its rate of return and it's just made its rate of return go down but it just there's only so much of that you could absorb okay. mr chairman mr hanlon uh, i i really take uh to heart mr feldman's point i mean in in some ways 
what we're dealing with here is the removal of the trees are being compensated for by what the testimony of the Conservation Commission was would be a great improvement as far as the tree cover is concerned, at least in the long term. Uh, Mr. Dip Moore did mention that in addition to the various non-native plants and the things that have to be taken out down in the back and, and will be restored as part of the urban park, uh, there are some other very impressive trees that have to be lost because there's going to be building there instead. And uh, without you know going in too much in detail on, on the waiver, uh, Mr. Moore did raise the question that Mr. Feldman agreed to take back to Mr. Majori about uh, compensation for that in connection with with Winnell Evans' uh, uh, suggestion. And and I'm not sort of I have an open mind on all of this, but it does seem to me that that's kind of a subject that is already agreed to be part of the conversation and. Uh, uh, I, I think that that whatever is done uh, about, if anything, about uh, asking for any part of the fees that would normally be done taken there, if they could be focused on the problem that Mr. Moore and Ms. Winnell and Ms. Evans have have indicated, so that it's all related to really an amenity to the property, making this area particular area more attractive rather than spreading the money around town that that would be more consistent with what we're about here and something and an element that maybe Mr. Feldman might want to mention when he has this conversation with Mr. Majori. Thank you for that. Um, next is uh, Title V, Article 8, Wetlands Protection. Uh, the Project is within Conservation Commission jurisdiction, requiring an order of conditions. The applicant seeks that the required order of conditions be included in a comprehensive permit uh, and waive the requirement or order of conditions be issued by the Conservation Commission. Proposed development meets the performance standards for the issuance of an order of conditions. So, um, Mr. Feldman, if you could explain that a little bit. My understanding is that you are working on an order of conditions currently with the Conservation Commission. Is that correct? Yeah, that order of conditions is under the Wetlands Protection Act, which is a state law, okay. which is a state law that um, we have to comply with regardless of uh, undertaking a 40B project. The town of Arlington has its own local municipal wetland bylaw. Um, the subject matter is the same as the Wetland Protection Act subject matter, but it is an independent permit and it requires um, um, independent relief. And in the context of a comprehensive permit, one-stop shopping, we need that permit issued by the ZBA. And so to the, to the extent um, I'm asking for a waiver that I get it from the Conservation Commission, it's because I got to get it from you. And yeah. again, when I was putting together this waiver list, I just wanted to make sure I wasn't missing anything. So I, I articulated as a waiver. I'm, again, I'm not sure that's particularly correct, but yeah. as long as I get the permit from you as the comprehensive permit, I don't have to go to the con comp board. I'm happy. <laughs> so, so, Mr. Chairman, you know, we've dealt with this on the previous 40B applications. Um, this is what I would call a procedural waiver request. Yeah. Um, I, it sounds as though they're not looking for relief from any of the substantive provisions of the local bylaw. Um, so we, it technically doesn't require a waiver. And what we generally do is note that the waiver you know, was requested, that it's denied because it's a pre procedural waiver, but that the permit is it's subsumed in the comprehensive permit and it's deemed granted as part of that. Thank you. And Paul, I, I actually just forwarded to you the two prior decisions. You'll see that language in, okay. in the requests as well. All right. And that may be the same thing for the next one as well. I was just going to say, yes, the, the next one is uh, Title V, Article 15 on stormwater management. Um, so that would be similar. Typically, there's a permit issued by the town engineer, um, and that would be issued as a part of the comprehensive permit. 
Um, the next one, as we discussed earlier tonight, is the Arlington Historic Commission, uh, that 1021 is a historic on the historic, historic structures inventory, um, and that the building, the project needs the demolition of the building in order to proceed. And so, um, as I said earlier, I'm going to uh, reach out to the Historic Commission um, and ask them to uh, submit a letter regarding the, um, the historic context for this building. Um, so that we have that on record and we can um, more fully discuss uh, the implications of the removal of this building um, and what that would have on on the town. So we will, uh, so rather this again would be uh, not be a, this would be a procedural request and not a, and not a waiver of the bylaw requirement. Um, the next outdoor lighting, um, Title Five, Article 14, uplighting is prohibited. The applicant yeah. seeks some uplighting. I think that's incorrect now, correct? We yeah, that. we we've we've it's, we've it's agreed out. to this. We could delete this one. Okay. Um, and then there's only one left, which is the sewer inflow and infiltration fees. Um yeah, we so requested this a request for inf and I fees. So this is a, a one again, Paul. You'll see in the in the uh, in the decisions that we've issued in the past, um, because there is no specific requirement and it's not well defined. Um, the board has is not in a position to impose it, um, and so typically, so we typically do waive the I and I fees um, right. for the forty B projects. Yeah. Again, I didn't know how to. This is sort of like a negative waiver. I didn't know how to ask for it because you don't have you don't have a, a a requirement. But the engineer's comments to the board says, "Oh, you guys should impose an I and I fee." And so I don't want you to I don't want you to listen to the engineer, <laughs> who by the way I spoke who by the way I spoke with. And specifically, yep. said, yeah, I've been, I, I, it's been on my list for the last eleven years to come up with some I and I policy for the town. I just haven't gotten to it yet. Um, <laughs> knew exactly what I was talking about because I, I wanted to confirm because I couldn't find any policy anywhere. And he goes, "No, we, we don't have one." I said, "Okay, we do not. I'll still keep it on the list just in case." <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um. Uh um, are there any questions from the board in regards to the waiver requests? Or if there's any questions from uh, yeah, from Mr. Reardon or Mr. Mulhern or Mr. Haverty? All set, thank you. All set, thank you. So with that, then, um, are there any, so that there be no further questions from the board or from the, the applicant, I will go ahead and um, reopen the hearing for public comment if there are questions or comments from the from the public in regards to um, the proposed waivers or the the ideas for proposed um, conditions. So, as per usual, that we take testimonies that relates to the matter at hand and should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing our decision. Um, if you would like to speak, please raise your hand using the raise hand feature, or if you're on phone, you can dial star nine to call in. Um, be recognized by the chair and given time uh, to make your comments. Um, I think we would go till till ten fifteen if there are such questions. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Taroni. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to uh, make sure that when you were reviewing the annual uh, planting and replacement and survivability report, there was, and I think it would be covered in our. Um, our permit anyways, but to have the commission have access to the site also to um, review the plants. And I don't know how that would take place with notice 
but uh, certainly we would also like to have the report in hand and then go uh, and review any of the planting that's taken place or any of the changes that are proposed. Well taken, thank you. And that was that was my only uh, my only comment. Thank you. Great, thank you. Are there any other public questions or comments? Seeing none, I'll go ahead and close public comment again. So on our agenda for tonight, um, we had we've talked about the progress on the wetlands protection, uh, the WPA application. We have talked briefly about the uh, construction management plan. We've talked about the historic status of the building. We've gone through waiver requests. We have gone through um, potential conditions. Are there, is there any other uh, new business that you wanted to raise this evening, uh, Paul? Um, no, I um, um, I think we're at the point where we, we are done with um, wanting to present subject matters to the ZBA. We, we don't have any other more, we don't have any other subject matters to present to the ZBA on this application. Um, we, we will certainly respond to the items that we heard tonight, uh, the, the you know the, the bike rack, uh, I, I will um, develop something with our uh, wetlands um, consultant on the annual report, so that Mr. Hanlon has a, a launching point on that condition. But I want to talk with our our uh, wetland scientists so we get something correct about that. Uh, I know we talked about a condition for the generator weekly run and 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 we'll list the private streets and um and I will bring back to uh Marjorie the contribution for street trees in the area other than responding to those things and reporting on where we are on the construction management plan and the conservation commission progress we we yeah. We feel like there's nothing, there are no other subject matters that are still open. Uh, those are the open items. Um, and um, I don't know if we're at this point, but um, it, I'm not sure there's a need for us to ask everybody to reconvene until after at least the next CONCOM meeting, uh, which is on April 13th. And so... Um, you know, I, I know we've been on a two week schedule, but I, I don't um, I, I don't think it's important to ask everybody to spend another evening, you know, to report back on these few items, which we, we can do in 10 minutes. What we really need to do address is CONCOM. And why don't we, um, you know, schedule a meeting after the next CONCOM meeting so we really know, are we on track or do we need more time to get this done? Okay. Um, my calendar. If you uh, the the first uh, Tuesday after the thirteenth uh, is the eighteenth of April, and I I know that I already have a planning board hearing that night in another community. Mm -hmm. um, so if if there's any way to do it on. For example, Monday the 17th instead of the 18th, I would appreciate that. That that um it's 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 um I know you guys are uh, and I don't know, are we allowed to continue to do Zoom meetings after March 31st? I haven't been I haven't been following that legislation. So the, the, the legislation actually um made it through conference today and is on the governor's desk. Okay, so and 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 what is it? Is it just another extension, Paul, or is it actually a permanent uh, change now? No, it, it's it, it is time. Um, I, I 
didn't really look at it that closely to see how long it was for. Okay, but it extends it past March 31st, so we could still work remotely in April if we had to. Yep. Okay. Well, I mean, that does make it a little easier for me to be at two places at one time. I just can't physically be presenting at two places at one time. So <laughs> I would prefer to prefer a different night, either the 17th or the 19th, if that's the week we should move to. Um, but again, I I always defer to the board schedule. You, you guys are the volunteers. Yeah. So this is this gets more complicated because we had a, a new comprehensive permit application be filed on Monday. Um, and so we need to get that's for 10 Sunnyside Avenue. So we need to schedule their first hearing within 30 days. So we're trying to figure where to fit that in our schedule too. Um, my original intent for them had been to see if they were amenable to April 20th, but unfortunately that's 31 days after the filing. Um, so we would need to get an extension from them in order to go with that date. Um, Pat, from our conversations earlier today, do you get the sense that we would, we might be able to open the public hearing for 10 Sunnyside a week earlier, maybe on the 13th? Or do you think that might be pushing it in terms of getting any comment back from the town? I think that would be a little bit, I think that would be, be hard because if we did that, then they'd have to, they'd have to, if to, to be really helpful, they'd have to really aim for a week before that, that would bring us back down to the sixth and mm -hmm. that's not very long. So yeah, I think it would be a push on them to be able to do that. Okay. All right. Paul, you had said that 18th was out for you. Um, um, again, if possible, uh, the, 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 uh, the seventeenth, the nineteenth. If I, I and, and again, uh, the concom is the thirteenth, so it really could yeah. be any day after the thirteenth. Right. So if you wanted to do it, well, the thirteenth is a Thursday, so it's Friday. You usually don't do these on a Friday, yeah. but. And Monday, the seventeenth is a holiday. Um, oh, it's so Patriot. Is what is Patriot Day? Patriot Day. Yeah. 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 So the question is, can you do it on Wednesday the 19th or? Um, so if we were to do it on the 19th, we could we would possibly have a meeting on the 19th and a meeting on the 20th. Um, or, Paul, we could do you on the 20th. Uh, the, only the, problem with, the, the only problem with us on the 20th is that would be the follow-up to CONCOM on the 13th oh, if we needed it. Yep, yep. So I, 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 I also you. have two meetings already on the 20th. That, that makes that problematic as well. Um, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, um, um, yeah, I don't think I'm indispensable to to the to the to the meeting on the 18th. That, um, Always difficult for an attorney to say. <laughs> no, no, I, I I really don't think I am. But I, you know, the 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 challenge is we're at the short strokes here, and um, I would hate something to come up that we could address that I'm not there to be able to do it and. Believe it or not, I, I've had this other matter going in Middleborough simultaneously with you guys for a while, and I've actually been logging on to your meeting after I've done their meeting. Their meeting starts at 630 from their town hall on a on my computer. The The problem is, is that I, I don't the, the, the on um, on the 18th, we have we're on the agenda after another matter. So there's no way I'm going to get reached and off by 7.30 that night. All right. And so did the 17th work? Well, it's I don't mind Patriots holiday. I oh, don't, that's right. Yeah, it's Patriots Day. Sorry. But is that is that are we prohibited from having a public hearing on that night? I don't 
think so. It's not an election day. That's usually the one that trips us up. Right. Um, so I think we could do the 17th, um, especially because we're not meeting in person. So we're not, there's no physical location. You know, we would need anyone to help set up or anything. Um, so I guess it's a question for members of the board. So this is Monday, April 17th. Are people available on that date? Or I am. Better question is, is anyone not available on Monday the 17th? I'm good. Okay. Same here. So it sounds like we, we should here. do Monday the 17th. And I am awesome. available. We'll have the Monotomy Minutemen attend as well and <laughs> do their little drum live show. Um, okay, so Monday the 17th at our usual 7.30 p.m. Mr. Chair? All right. Yes. Marie Salau, Senior Planner. I was just wondering, when was oh, hi. the... Hi. When was the 180th day after the hearing started? So the original scheduled date was the 16th of April. But we, uh, by mutual agreement with the applicant, we have moved that out to April 30th. Ah, okay, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Okay, so then I think we would be looking to continue rather than uh, April 11th, which would be our, our next normal date, uh, we would be doing it until the 17th instead. Or not, sorry, not the 11th. When was it? Yeah. So we'll go so we'll be Monday the, Monday the 17th. Um, so one other uh, matter before us on this. Um, so we, the board has received um, three of the written transcripts.